Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot to Daniel and Jan for organizing this. Um, so since, well, we're all sort of stuck at home and uh, everything is bleak outside, I thought I'd choose a topic which is somehow technically not too demanding. Uh, so have a little bit of sort of light entertainment for mathematical physicists. Um, so this is based on a joint work with uh, Giuseppe Canizzaro, who is at, uh, well, both Warwick and Imperial uh, currently. And so this work is sort of in the general area of trying to understand uh, one plus one dimensional sort of surface fluctuation models. So the type of models that we'd be interested in in are the following. So you look at kind of stochastic processes that depend on a spatial variable and on a time variable. Uh, so let's call it uh, H, for example, with the following property. So time, space will always be one dimensional uh, for me. So it could be the reals, but maybe it could be the integers as well. Um, you could compactify it, so it could be a circle. Time is obviously going to be one dimensional. Then uh, we want the following property. So we want some kind of local specification. So we want, if you want the rules of how H gets updated at some space time point, should only depend on what it looks like, you know, in some sort of reasonably local region around that point. Uh, slides are cut on the left. Oh, is that true? Daniel, do you see my slides? Um, no, I see everything. Okay, so then that must be a local problem. Um, so we want the, the way it behaves to only depend on the shape of what it looks like locally. Uh, we want that specification to be sort of translation invariant in space and time, so it shouldn't somehow explicitly depend on where you are in space or when you are in time. Um, and we also want it to be sort of translation invariant vertically. So what I mean by this is that if uh, locally, for example, H has some kind of shape like this, then, you know, the actual value here of H shouldn't matter in the rule of how this is going to evolve, right? So if I translate everything vertically, uh, if I move everything here up or down, uh, the rule of how it's going to update itself should be equivariant sort of with respect to that motion, okay? Um, and then the general question that we'd be interested in is the following, is, you know, you want to understand the kind of large scale behavior of a process like this. Um, and so you ask yourself the following question. So if I re rescale space by, you know, some large amount, say one over epsilon, then how should I rescale time and the height itself uh, in such a way that there's a non-trivial limit? Okay, so in other words, can I find exponents alpha and beta so that if I rescale h by epsilon to the beta in time and then h itself by epsilon to the alpha, and maybe I subtract, you know, there might be some kind of law of large number terms. So for example, my model might just move up, move up at some kind of constant speed or move down at some constant speed on average. Then I want to remove this. So I just want to look at the fluctuations. Um, and the question is, you know, for which models do you have a limit like this and what kind of limits can you get? Um, and then that's of course what we call a universality class here is essentially the basin of attraction of a given limit, h. Okay. Now, let me show you first a couple of simple examples. So you've always, you probably all have seen that example already. So that's the symmetric simple exclusion process, sometimes called the solid on solid model. Uh, so here space is discrete. Uh, so it's just the integers and h takes discrete values as well. So it takes values in the integers. And I'm going to assume that I start with an initial condition that sort of looks like this, in the sense that the difference between the values of H at two neighboring values is always exactly either plus one or minus one. Okay, so it kind of looks like a random walk. Um, and 
here the natural evolution is the following. So you pick a point at random, and then if the point you've picked is a local maximum, then you turn it into a local minimum. If the point you've picked is a local minimum, like here, then you turn it into a local maximum. Uh, and if the point you've picked is somewhere here on a slope, so that it's neither local minimum nor local maximum, then you just do nothing. Okay? Um, and you do this in the usual way. So you just say attach a Poisson clock independently to each, uh, each of the sites, and you run with that evolution. And this is very well known that here, if you take exponents beta equal two, so that's the diffusive scaling in time, uh, and alpha equal a half, so you rescale the height of the height function by uh, epsilon to the one half, then this converges to what's called the Edwards Wilkinson model, or if you want the stochastic heat equation, okay, which is just this uh, heat equation with a space time white noise term. Right, so this guy, psi here, is space time white noise. What this really means is that at least formally, rule of psi of Tx, psi of uh, Sy, is sort of delta correlated, both in space and in time. Now, uh, one property of that model here is that it has lots of symmetries. So it's symmetric, obviously, on the sort of flipping space around, x goes to minus x. But it's also symmetric on the t goes to minus t. Um, and it's symmetric on the h goes to minus h. Okay, so all these symmetries are easy to see already at the microscopic model. Now there's a second standard example that you've probably all seen at some point, which is ballistic deposition. So again, uh, H is discrete, so I make spaces discrete and the values are discrete. And this time I think of H as being the height of a pile of bricks. Okay, so I have a pile of bricks that are sort of, that lay on the floor like you see here, and then H is really sort of like the height of the highest brick above any one point. And the evolution now is the following. Well, basically you choose a location at random and then a brick falls down from the sky um, and they just pile up. And the only thing that makes the evolution interesting is the fact that bricks can also stick to their neighbors. So for example, if you have a brick falling down here, then it's going to stick here because it can stick to that neighboring brown brick here and it doesn't fall all the way down to here, right? So here the evolution does this. Now, in this particular case, uh, there's no theorem that tells you what this converges to, but there's a conjecture, which is that the correct exponent this time is, well, alpha is still supposed to be one half, uh, so that tells you that, well, at fixed time as a function of space, it should be scaling, the limit should be scale invariant with exponent a half, and actually it should look like a brand new motion. Uh, but in time, the correct scaling is no longer diffusive, but the conjectured exponent is three half rather than two. And there is a conjecture for what the scaling limit should be. And it's what uh, people call the KPZ fixed point which is also the conjectured scaling limit of the uh, KPZ equation, right? So remember the KPZ equation is this stochastic PD, which looks a little bit like the stochastic heat equation we saw on the previous slide, but with an additional uh, quadratic nonlinearity. And well, the solution to this stochastic PD is not itself scale invariant. So the solution to this equation is not the scaling limit of this ballistic deposition, but the conjecture is that both of them have the same scaling limit. Now, proving this is surprisingly hard. It seems like a very simple model. Um, one has a clear conjecture of what the limit should be. But for example, even actually writing down what the limit really is, so characterizing this KPZ fixed point beyond just giving the scaling exponents, was only done uh, about three years ago. So that's a paper by uh, Matetsky, Ramenik, and Poistel, 
in which they uh, prove that the um, totally asymmetric simple exclusion process, so that's basically the same model as on the previous slides, but instead of taking the symmetric model in which local maxima can turn into local minima and vice versa, you take the completely asymmetric model in which only local minima turn into the local maxima, and that's it. Um, and for that particular model, they were able to show that there is a scaling limit with these scaling exponents, uh, and they were able to give a complete characterization of that scaling limit. But it's no longer a simple characterization like what we had on the previous slide. In the previous slide, we could just write down an SPDE, um, and it was Gaussian, and it, you can easily say, answer pretty much any question you want about the scaling limit. Uh, here, it's a rather complicated object. Now, in terms of symmetries here, well, obviously, you still have an x goes to minus x symmetry, which is true at the level of the discrete model already. But then there is a second symmetry, uh, which is not true at the level of the discrete model here, but which is true for the KPZ fixed point. So it's true in the scaling limit, which is that if you reverse time, so if you sort of run the movie backwards, that's the same as mapping h to minus h. Okay, so the process is not symmetric under just time reversal or just mapping h to minus h, but it's symmetric under the composition of both operations. Okay. Now, so here are some common properties of the limits that we get. So now obviously in both cases, the limit is going to be translation invariant, or at least the specifications of the limit are going to be translation invariant because that was true uh, for the discrete models that we started with. Now, for the discrete model, we had a sort of approximately local specification in the sense that things only depend, the evolution only depended on what we see at neighboring sites. Um, in the scaling limit, this becomes somehow strictly local. So that's, so both of these limits have some, have some sort of space time version of the Markov property. Uh, which essentially says that if you if you draw a picture of space time, so if you have space here, you have time here, um, and then you draw some kind of line like this, but it doesn't have to be a horizontal line. And now you condition the process on knowing everything that's below here, then uh, the evolution you know, sort of like the value of the process at some point above conditioned on the whole blue region should actually only depend on the values of the process on the, uh, on the red line. Okay, so that's kind of like a space-time version of the usual Markov property. And then, of course, since they were built as scaling limits, uh, they should themselves be scale invariant, right? So these processes in both cases uh, they satisfy this exact scale invariance. Now, one thing that one would really like to know is what are all the processes that satisfy these properties? Uh, and essentially the answer is that we have no clue. Okay, so if there's no space, so if there's only time, and you ask for all the processes that satisfy sort of the analogs, of these properties, then we have a full classification. So essentially the only processes that satisfy all of these properties are the stable Levy processes. Okay, and in this particular case, for example, that imposes, well, then there is no X. Uh, so that means that in a way, one of these two exponents can be fixed. So say we can fix beta equal to one, uh, and that enforces then alpha bigger than one half, for example. Right, so you have so you cannot necessarily find uh, processes with these properties for any choice of exponents, uh, alpha and beta. But in general, if we add space here, we have basically there's no known classification in general. Uh, the only somehow exception that I'm aware of is if you remove time and you look at only processes that only depend on space, but you make space two-dimensional. Uh, and the difference is that now you also 
in force invariance under rotations. Right? So here it's in space time, it's not natural to enforce invariance under rotations. Our discrete models certainly don't have any sort of invariance under space time rotations. Uh, but if in two dimensional space you in, enforce invariance under rotations, uh, then it's natural to actually enforce conformal invariance, and then you get the 2D conformal field theories. And there we have a full classification, of course. Uh, but that's pretty much the only example that I know of. Now, so the cartoon of what we have so far is essentially the following, right? So we have these two fixed points, which were this Edwards-Wilkinson model, and we have this KPZ fixed point. And then we have a whole bunch of discrete models. So every point in space here, so this here, if you want, is a cartoon of the space of models. So every point in that cartoon is just a model of interface fluctuation. And the line sort of the evolution is the operation of zooming out. Okay, and so as you zoom out, um, you converge to some limiting model. And here we've seen two possible limits that you can converge to, which is this Edwards-Wilkinson model and this KPZ fixed point. Um, now, one thing you can ask yourself, well, so we have these basins of attraction. So most, if you sort of look at your favorite uh, interface fluctuation model, chances are that as you zoom out, unless you somehow make it very symmetric, so it has the symmetries of the Edwards-Wilkinson model, uh, chances are that as you zoom out, it's going to converge to a KPZ fixed point. So that seems to be the most stable uh, randomization fixed point here. So one question one can ask oneself, for example, is what are, is there a heteroclinic orbit, like what I drew in red here, which connects these two fixed points? So is there a model which has the property that if you zoom out, you converge to the KPZ fixed point, and if you zoom in, you converge to the Edwards-Wilkerson model? Uh, so that one, there's a clear, well, so there's one model which we know which has these properties, which is the KPZ equation, which I wrote down uh, on the previous slide. Remember, so that was this uh, heat equation with additional quadratic nonlinearity. And that, that equation here, if you look at how the coefficients behave under the Edwards-Wilkinson, rescaling, what you see is that if you zoom in, uh, the nonlinearity picks up a coefficient and that coefficient goes to zero. So essentially the nonlinearity disappears uh, in the limit and you're just left with the uh, Edwards-Wilkinson model. Um, whereas if you zoom out, then basically the nonlinearity is all that's left. Uh, and somehow that linear part and the noise part disappear. And then, well, you converge to the KPZ fixed point, which in some sense you can view as some sort of weak solution to that equation, but it's definitely not the entropy solution to that equation. So it's still a genuinely stochastic process. Um, so one natural question, which people have studied quite a bit, what's you know, can we actually prove that this is the unique process with these properties? So there's, so we don't have a proof of that, um, but then sort of the kind of statements that go in that direction would be the following type of statement. So take a sequence of models that depends on the parameter and which is such that for one, specific value of the parameter, it's symmetric. And so as you zoom out, it converges to this Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point. And then as you vary the parameter, it becomes asymmetric. And so you expect it to converge to the KPZ fixed point. So now what happens if you take a sort of joint limit? So if you make, let that parameter go to zero, which means that you essentially look at a model which is very, very close uh, to this green line here. So it's very close to the basin of attraction for Edwards-Wilkinson. But then you zoom out and you zoom out sort of just sufficiently far uh, so that you actually see the model being genuinely different from uh, a model in the Edwards-Wilkinson class. So then what you would expect is to see something which is like this blue line here, 
where you end up being very close to that red line. So you end up being, uh, you end up converging to the KPZ equation if you do the scalings in the correct way. Um, and so the conjecture here is that if you take such a family of models, just parameterize sort of in the correct way by some sort of strength of the asymmetry, then it should be possible to find a constant C epsilon so that if you rescale this according to the Edwards Wilkinson rescaling and you put yourself just at the right scale, so that's somehow what I mean here by the correctly parameterized. So maybe the epsilon here, if you parameterize it wrongly, then the epsilon here would just not be the same as the epsilon here. You would have to somehow choose the relation here correctly. Um, but if you rescale it in that way, then it should converge to a solution to this KPZ equation. And so now a natural question is, well, since there is this very nice model, which is a ballistic deposition, which is sort of really the standard model for um, interface growth or one of the standard models for interface growth. Um, now, the next best thing from proving that ballistic deposition is in the KPZ universality class would be to have a statement like this, right? So the question is, is there a natural one parameter family which contains the ballistic deposition model uh, and for which we have a statement like that? So then that would be- and There is a question in the chat. Yes. Oh, sorry. What sense yeah. do you uh, in what sense do, right. So, okay, so by now, the, okay, so there are various interpretations. So you can interpret it um, as the log. So originally, when it was first introduced, uh, people used the fact that if you define, uh, if you look at the exponential of h, then formally what z satisfies is some kind of multiplicative stochastic heat equation. And then this can be interpreted in the Ito sense. Uh, and you can define H to be the logarithm of that. Um, now also this class of equations falls within uh, all these recent theories like regularity structures or power control calculus, uh, which also give interpretations to this equation. And the process that you get with these theories coincides with this Kohl-Hopf solution that was already used by Bertini and Jacobin when they proved, for example, that weakly asymmetric simple exclusion converges to the KPZ equation. Okay, so, the, so by now there are various interpretations, but they all coincide. So they all give you the same stochastic process. Maybe modulo, I mean, the only thing is that maybe here there's a constant and sort of the natural value of that constant maybe changes a little bit from one interpretation to the other, uh, but it essentially gives you the same process. So this is sort of well-defined. Um, well, so here, does it depend on the initial condition? Uh, well, of course, if you take a scaling limit, if you want to actually just take one single process, rescale it, get a limit, then of course you need to take an initial condition that has itself a scaling limit. So for example, zero, uh, or for example, something like a random walk. Um, but then here, the equation that you get, so this equation is just a perfectly well-posed equation. You can start with any uh, initial condition. Right? So of course the solution depends on the initial condition, obviously. Now, so here's a natural one parameter family that you, that you could look at. So one way of writing ballistic deposition is the following. So remember you choose a site X at which you know, the process gets updated. And the way it gets updated is that you have this brick falling down and then it either piles up onto the brick that's just below it, which means that H would be replaced by H plus one, or it sticks to one of the two neighboring values. And in this case, if it sticks to one of the two neighboring bricks, then the new value of H is just either the value that you see on the left or the value that you see on the right. Okay. Um, and whatever happens is whatever comes first as you fall down, which means that the new value of H is just the maximum between these three values. Right? And now of course, you know, if you do statistical mechanics and you see a maximum, then you kind of think of 
zero temperature. Um, and then if you think of zero temperature, then of course you just think of finite temperature. So, so you can introduce a temperature, an inverse temperature beta, and replace the maximum by a sort of finite temperature version of the maximum, which means that, um, well, you choose one of the three values at random with a probability that's proportional to the exponential of that value. Right? So now if beta is equal to infinity, right? so then that means that you just choose the largest value always. Right? And then that's just ballistic deposition. So zero temperature would just be ballistic deposition. Um, this model clearly still has the properties that we want in the sense that, well, it's clear that the specification is local. It's not completely clear a priori does it, that it doesn't depend on the actual height that you're at. But if you think for a second, it does, right? Because if I shift everything by a fixed amount, then what it corresponds to, if I shift all the possible values by, you know, one, then all it does is multiply everything here by exponential beta. But then that gets divided through when I normalize this to be a probability measure. And so it doesn't change anything, right? So, so now we have this zero temperature, which is ballistic deposition. We have a finite temperature process. Um, and so the natural, sort of like the most symmetric one here is the infinite temperature version, right? So the infinite temperature version is the one where beta is equal to zero. And that just means that you pick one of the three values at random every time. Um, and so you can ask yourself, what does that rescale to? So, well, what we would hope is that it rescales to Edwards Wilkinson. So let me just show you some simulations. So this is ballistic deposition. Okay, so I, I hope you can see. Uh, so this is a simulation of ballistic deposition. You see the bricks kind of piling up. Um, and I can, I can rescale this. So here you see sort of ballistic deposition running really fast. Um, and this, well, you see at fixed time, you see this interface, which looks roughly like, well, I don't know if it looks very much like a Brownian motion, but, but at least for very large scale, maybe the scale here isn't quite large enough. Uh, for very large scale, it should look essentially like a Brownian motion. Um, so that's the uh, zero temperature. So now what happens as we uh, increase the temperature, so here I have this temperature slider. So I go all the way to infinite temperature. So the process somehow looks like this. Uh, so as I zoom out, I see something like this. Now, clearly, uh, what you see here does not look like the Edward Wilkerson model. Okay, so we have a one parameter family. Uh, it seems to rescale to something. It doesn't seem to rescale to a Brownian motion, right? So like the previous one ballistic position, maybe it didn't look that much like a Brownian motion, but at least it looked like there was a continuous uh, interface that we get in the scaling limit. Um, here, well, at large scale, you see these kind of plateaus uh, and you see these big jumps, right? So it looks like if there is a scaling limit, it looks like it's a discontinuous uh, kind of limit. Uh, there is a question about uh, the meaning of colors. Oh, they don't mean anything. So the color is mostly there to make it look pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, it vaguely represents the time at which the brick was added. Okay, so the, uh, the color is not a, it's a sort of random function of time, but then you, you see here the sort of stratas uh, with more or less the same color, and these represent bricks that were added at more or less the same time. Okay. So that's, uh, that's essentially what the color represents here. Now, so the limiting guy here at infinite temperature, it still has the x goes to minus x symmetry. So that's true for, for every temperature. 
it actually has the h goes to minus h symmetry as well, which is not completely obvious from the description here because it's actually not true at the discrete level. Um, but it is true for the limiting process. Um, it does not have a t goes to minus t uh, symmetry. So it cannot be equal to uh, Edwards Wilkinson. We've seen already from the simulation that it's clearly not Edwards Wilkinson. So can we give a description of the scaling limit? So do we have a nice sort of properties of that scaling limit? Now, if you think for a moment about what this um, sort of infinite temperature version of ballistic deposition does, well, you can come up with a sort of nice graphical construction of it. And so that works in the following way. So you draw uh, your space time. Okay, so here horizontally I have space. Uh, vertically I have time. So space is discrete, time is continuous. So I have these vertical lines that are my timelines. And now on every timeline, uh, I put a Poisson process or I put say three independent Poisson processes uh, at the same rate. And for one of the three, I put a, whenever the, for every event of the Poisson process, I put a red dot. For the second one, for every event of the Poisson process, I put an arrow that points to the right. And for the last one at every event of the Poisson process, I put an arrow that points to the left. Okay, so now I have this picture with red dots, say cookies, uh, and arrows that point to the right, arrows that point to the left. And now you can convince yourself that uh, one way of building this sort of infinite temperature ballistic deposition is the following. So if I want to know the value at some space time point, like the one here, what I do is I just run backwards in time and always follow the arrows. Okay, so here I see an arrow that points to the right, so I follow to the right. Then I continue going backwards in time. Here I have an incoming arrow, so I don't follow it because it's an arrow that comes in. Here I have another incoming arrow, so I don't follow it. But now I have another outgoing arrow, so I follow the outgoing arrow all the way down to time zero. And what I do is I count the number of cookies that I've eaten on the way. Okay, so here by going back, I encounter two cookies. And so that means that the value of my process at this location is going to be two. Say, st say if I start with initial condition zero. Okay. Um, if I look at a different location here, I do exactly the same thing. So I run also backwards in time. And you see that these trajectories here, they coalesce. And so here in this particular case, I only encounter one cookie. Uh, it means that the value of h at this point is one. Okay. So now once you have this graphical construction, uh, well, it's sort of clear from the construction what would be the scaling exponents and what would be the scaling limit. Oh, somebody cannot hear me. Can you, Daniel, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, so then that must be local. Yeah. Um, so, so here it's clear that, you know, these backward motions here, they're, they're just some kind of random walks, right? So they're actually just continuous time random walks. Uh, so the correct scaling to see something non-trivial would be the diffusive rescaling so that these become brand new motions. So that tells me that again in space, I should rescale diffusively, which gives me beta equal two. And then the correct scaling uh, for H itself, you can, uh, you can somehow, con you can convince yourself that it would be alpha equal one. So why alpha equal one and not one half? Well, one is really a half times two actually. Okay, so that's the reason for one and not a half. Uh, and the reason why a half times two is because, well, if I want, non-trivial fluctuations here. So the fluctuations that I get here are essentially fluctuations in the number of cookies that I eat, right? But now 
I've rescaled time by an exponent two. So if I rescale space by one of epsilon, it means that in time, I already look at times of order one of epsilon square. And so in a time of order one of epsilon square, the typical fluctuations of the number of cookies that I eat are going to be of order one of epsilon, right? So that's the uh, exponent one here. Um, and so you can, from the graphical construction, you can sort of immediately see what the finite space, sort of the K point distribution of the scaling limit is, right? So if I, um, if I have my sort of space time here, I take K different space time points. So for example, three here, then what I'm going to do in the scaling limit is for each of them, I have a Brownian motion going backwards. But these Brownian motions are independent up until the first time when they meet, at which point they coalesce. And then what I do is I look at the corresponding tree structure. So here I have a tree structure with, well, as a tree, this picture here looks like this, right? So I have a, uh, these line segments. So every segment here has a certain length. So the length of this segment here, for example, is just the time difference between this point, which is the leaf here, and that coalescence time, which is that time here. The length of that segment is just that interval of time and so on. And now to each segment, I associate an independent Gaussian random variable with variance equal to the time, to the time length of the segment. Um, and then I get my sort of three point distribution to be simply the random variable that I obtain by, well, the value here is just going to be the sum of these two Gaussian random variables. The value here is the sum of these three and the value here is the sum of these three, okay? So that's somehow clearly the scaling limit that I get. Um, but of course that's, okay, so that's immediate, but that's not very satisfactory because it just gives me, it gives me the K point distributions, but it doesn't give me at all any sort of sample path properties, right? So for example, we've seen in the simulation uh, that it looks like that limit as a process, it's discontinuous in space. Uh, so it's not obvious to see this from a description like this, just in terms of uh, K-point distribution, right? So we would like to have a more, so in some sense, a complete distribution of like all space-time point at once that give us more of a pathwise understanding of that process. So the first ingredient you want for that is, well, the analog of this construction, but now where instead of just starting from finitely many points in space time, you start from like every space time point at once. Okay, so that's something called the Brownian web. Uh, so that was introduced by Werner and Toth um, sometime in the 90s, but then it was studied quite a bit in the early 2000s by uh, Chuck Newman, Fontes, and Ron Feng Soon. Um, so this is a picture, if you want, of the Brownian web. So the Brownian web is like the continuum object that you get by having coalescing Brownian motions starting from every point in space time simultaneously. Uh, so one thing that one, one can show, one can really construct this as an actual uh, topological space. So you, what you see here is that in some sense, this is just one big tree, right? Because uh, so if you take any two points in space time, if you follow for long enough, eventually they're going to coalesce, right? Uh, so actually you can really view this as just one topological space, which is just one big tree um, that comes together with an embedding into R2. Right? So it's really kind of a topological space, uh, well, metric space, because there's a natural distance between two points, which is the distance that you get, well, to go from here to here, for example, I should follow this trajectory and that trajectory until they meet. 
And then I look at how long, well, how long did I have to wait here? How long did I have to wait here? And I just add up these two amounts of time. So that gives me a natural distance function uh, on that space. Okay. So, so this can be constructed. And, and then on that uh, space, I can build some kind of a branching Brownian motion. So essentially, as I uh, tried to explain before, on every segment, to every segment, we would like to uh, assign a Gaussian random variable with variance sort of equal to that line segment, but we want to do this sort of in a continuum way. Um, and you can, uh, you can do this. And the um, colors were related to the time of creation of the wall. Oh, so on, in the picture here, yes, so in the picture here, the colors are related, right, okay, so it, it's a non-trivial fact that you can kind of color this in a nice way, uh, in the sense that each of these Brownian motions has a age, if you want, and then the color, so it has a birth time, and the color represents, if you want, the birth time of that Brownian motion, uh, and the way what you impose is that if two of them coalesce, then the color that you continue with is the color of the older one of the two. Mm. Okay. Um, and you can really assign an age like this to every trajectory in a consistent way. Again, okay. so that's what gives the colors here. Um, and of course here I made sort of like very young ones are essentially white. That's why you actually see something kind of nicely. Otherwise it would just look like a big mess. Um, okay, so you can, now you can get a number of properties for that process. So for example, one question you can ask yourself, what does it look like for fixed T? So in both Edwards Wilkinson and KPZ, for fixed T as a function of X, it essentially looked like a Brownian motion. Now, Brownian motion is itself Markov. So here, uh, well, from the sort of scaling experiment, we see that as a function of space, it has to be scale invariant with scaling exponent one. And there is a stochastic process, which is Markovian, which is scale invariant with scaling exponent one, which is the Cauchy process. And actually you can show also that this process has the property that if you take uh, any fixed time and you look at two space points that are not too far away from each other and then you divide by the distance you look at the difference between the values of h you divide by the distance between these points so it's some sort of discrete derivative then this as y goes to x this converges to a Cauchy, in law converges to a Cauchy random variable okay. uh, and that's of course also true for the Cauchy process the Cauchy process has exactly the same property actually it has the property that this is equal to Cauchy even without taking the limit, right? So it has that equality in law uh, already like this, if you want. Um, now the same is true here if you take the actual stationary version. So you can ask yourself, is this guy a Cauchy process for fixed time? Um, so this we can answer that it's not, and not only it's not a Cauchy process, it really doesn't look like a Cauchy process. It sort of vaguely looks like a Cauchy process in terms of there are many almost sure properties that are the same, uh, but there are almost sure properties that are different. So, so we can show that if you take sort of on any fixed space interval, if you compare the law of the process to the law of the Cauchy process, they are mutually singular. So they really look different. Um, now, We've seen in the, um, uh, in the simulations, we saw these discontinuities. So you can show that the process has a version which is Cadillac. So it is basically, it has discontinuities and the discontinuities are only of jump type. Uh, so it doesn't have any sort of oscillatory kind of discontinuities. Um, but we, we saw in the simulations that these discontinuities, they appear to be sort of persistent. Right, so once you have a high a discontinuity with a high jump, then that persists for quite a long time. Right, so we see here in the simulations, uh, for example, here on the right, you see this very high tall jump, and it sort of basically so now it disappeared. Right, but it persisted for quite a long time. 
Um, so we can ask ourselves, you know, can we sort of track these discontinuities? So what's the behavior of the discontinuities? Um, and it turns out that you can, you can do that and you actually have a nice, uh, you can sort of see the behavior of the discontinuities. There's a link between the behavior of the discontinuities and the special points in this Brownian web. So it turns out that, so the Brownian web were, the, were these coalescing Brownian motions starting from every space time point. So it turns out that the Brownian web has a dual. So in the sense that, um, in the following sense that, you know, you have these coalescing Brownian motions starting from every space time point. Uh, and there is a dual that kind of also starts from every space time point, but actually runs backwards in time or forward in that picture and has the property that the dual the trajectories of the dual never intersect the trajectories of the forward one, right? So the red lines here never intersect the black lines. Um, and furthermore, the dual is uniquely determined by the forward one, okay? So if you know the picture of the black lines, then the red lines are actually deterministically, deter completely determined by the black ones and vice versa, okay? But each of them has this, both of them have the same law, except that they're kind of flipped upside down. Um, and now there are, there are seven types of special points in the Brownian web that correspond to these type of configurations. Okay, so a typical, a generic point is a point like this. So where you just have one trajectory coming out uh, forward and one backward trajectory. But then you also have points that are, sit on the trajectory and so on, right? So you have these seven different types of points. Um, it turns out that they all sort of play a nice role if you look at the life of a discontinuity. So, so what do I mean by this? Um, so imagine that you have, um, imagine you have a discontinuity that gets created at some time here, and then it's going to move. So now the discontinuity is going to move according to a Brownian motion. And it turns out, so what you can show is that, you know, we have this Brownian web given by these type of characteristics. Um, well, the motion of the discontinuities is given by following trajectories of the dual Brownian web. Okay, so we have a trajectory like this in the dual. Um, but now how can a discontinuity be created? Because typically, well, if you have a typical element of the dual, say that gets created here, well, what you would expect is that, well, if I have another one that's created a little bit earlier, then that's going to you know, coalesce with this one pretty quickly. And that really means that there was another discontinuity that was actually created early on. Uh, and this one really just merged into the other one. And, I should really consider this discontinuity as having been created at this time point and not at this time point. So the only way you can have a time point at which a discontinuity is actually created is if it gets somehow shielded. So the way it can be shielded is if at the same time, there are three trajectories that are created starting from the same point. Right, so now in the special points of the Brownian web, it turns out that this actually happens. So if you take a deterministic space-time point, this doesn't happen, but there are random points at which this happens. Um, and now, of course, if you have such a point like this, well, the middle trajectory in a way is shielded by these two guys that were created at the same time. Right? Because if I look at these other trajectories that were created early on, these other discontinuities, they would merge into one of the two guardians somehow, right? Um, but now this discontinuity, the only way that itself, it disappears, um, well, is actually if one of its two guardians, you know, turns against it and sort of, you know, eats it up again, right? So then you have a coalescence point here uh, at which the discontinuity disappears. So th now that's another type of point in the Brownian web. Um, and no other picture. Question. 
Yes. Is that the origin of the M argent H minus H symmetry? Uh, the H goes to minus H symmetry really comes from the Gaussianity in the limit, right? So it really just comes from, you look at the explicit construction and it comes from the, uh, the symmetry of the uh, Gaussian random variables that you get in the limit for these cookies that you eat up. So, so here the creation of a singularity was a point of this type, right? Where you had sort of three elements in the dual web uh, that start from the same point. And the sort of end of the life of a singularity, we see that's a point of this type here, where you have two elements in the two trajectories of the dual web that coalesce, right? And so one of them gets annihilated. Um, and the meaning of blue and black? So here, blue and black is one of them are the trajectories in the forward and one of them in the backward Brownian web, right? So there's the Brownian web and there's the dual Brownian web. So there's two Brownian webs that are kind of uh, interconnected like this. And one of them is black, one of them is blue. Uh, and they cannot cross, right? So you see in the picture that somehow the black and the blue, even though at, in some sense they, they can touch the same point, but they cannot actually cross each other. Um, and now, in the original Brownian web, uh, well, out of this point, so you have a trajectory emanating from this point here. So since this is one of these triple points, so you actually have three trajectories emanating from this point, like that. Um, and these two trajectories, well, they necessarily have to coalesce precisely at that point here, which was the point where my singularity was created, right? Um, and now what do these two guys represent? Well, they represent the basin of attraction of the singularity, so which means that if I take any uh, singularity that is created anywhere inside uh, the region delimited by these two red lines, then since, since it's not allowed to cross the red line, it means that necessarily it's going to merge into the singularity that I'm tracking. So let me sort of redraw it in black. So that's the one that I'm tracking from its birth until its death here. Um, and so, so the, from every point between these two red lines, uh, every singularity that is, gets created somewhere in this space-time region necessarily must merge into these one, this one singularity that I'm tracking, right? So this is actually somehow the basin of attraction uh, of my singularity. And so what you see here is now that these uh, special points here, they are basically the points that correspond to the boundary of this basin of attraction. Whereas this special point here corresponds to, oops, corresponds to points that are on the singularity itself. And then the remaining two special points here, they correspond to situation where, well, actually what really happens is that if I look at the joint law of the black guy here and one of the red guys, then that's basically two brown emotions that reflect off each other. And what it means is that in reality, it doesn't quite look the way I drew it. In reality, these can bounce off each other. So the black one, uh, so I should really draw it like this, where the black can actually bounce off the red. So they cannot cross, but they can bounce off each other. And the points at which they bounce off each other, whoops, sorry. So the points at which they bounce off each other, that's the special points of these two, these two types. Um, and so finally, in the last, let me just sort of maybe finish on some kind of conjecture. Um, so where does that sort of leave us, right? So we had the Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point. So we have the KPZ fixed point. 
Um, so now we have a third renormalization fixed point, which is in some sense, it's also free, uh, but it's not Gaussian. It's free in the sense that, you know, it's clearly somehow built in a rather simple way out of Gaussian objects, uh, unlike the KPZ fixed point, which is a genuinely sort of nonlinear renormalization fixed point. So, it's, so that's this Brownian castle. So we call it the Brownian castle from the, because in the simulation, it sort of looks like these towers appearing and disappearing. Um, and we've seen that in some sense, the KPZ fixed point was more stable than the Edwards Wilkinson fixed point. So now this Brownian castle is also somewhat non generic. So it seems to be rather unstable also. And so you can ask yourself are there sort of analogs to the KPZ equation? Remember the KPZ equation is sort of like the heteroclinic orbit that connects uh, Edwards Wilkinson to KPZ. So you can ask yourself, do you have heteroclinic orbits like that or like that, that connect this Brownian castle to either Edwards Wilkinson or KPZ? Or maybe, well, the question is also in which direction do the arrows go here? Uh, so the conjecture is that the arrows go the way I drew them here. Uh, so that's based well, so the this part of the conjecture is based on numerical simulation. This part is based on calculations. Um, and what seems to happen at least, so here it looks like there's a chance that this heteroclinic orbit is really just one single orbit in the sense that there's one process with these properties that converges to KPZ as you zoom out and to the Brownian castle as you zoom in. Here it appears that the picture is actually more like that. So it seems that you can actually construct an infinite dimensional family here of processes that all have the property that as you zoom out, they converge to the Edwards Wilkinson process. Uh, and as you zoom in, they converge to the Brownian castle. And so we have a well, so we sort of have a construction uh, of these processes, but that's not, uh, not really complete yet. And so I think I should stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Well, let us thank uh, Martin. So uh, thank you for your attention. share some type of symplectic data, so there has to be some type of period data that's going to be shared on the algebra geometric side. Um, oh, are there so questions? So everybody's unmuted, so let me actually mute so uh, again people. that they share, and then that course. So sorry, I muted everybody to make sure, but uh, if somebody's speaking, it's uh, voluntarily. So let me actually immediately, I think uh, everybody can unmute themselves automatically. So are there any questions? So Larvi has a question in the chat. Actually, Jakob, Bjornberg also. Uh, I'm not sure the reflection I was talking about in the beginning, how would you do that in a one dimensional? I'm not sure which reflection you mean. Uh, Labi, maybe could you unmute yourself for the reflection of? Uh, oh, can you? I, I think you can unmute yourself because. Or can you? Oh, so sorry. So um, let me unmute. Unmute again. And you no, yeah, yeah, so sorry. So now you can uh, unmute yourself. So you can ask question. So Larby. Hello. Can you hear me? We do. 
Okay, so uh, my question was about the reflection at the when the minimum becomes a, a local minimum becomes becomes a, a maximum and the local maximum becomes a minimum that Martin showed through a picture. So the question is, how would you uh, do that for a simple random walk? I'm not sure uh, what that reflection means actually. Right, the very beginning. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let me try. Right. So here, uh, so I really just mean that, right? So you start from a, so you have a, assume that you have a configuration that somehow goes like this. Uh, and then, you know, your Poisson clock at this site here rings, you see a local maximum. Uh, what you do is you just turn it into a local minimum. So you just decrease the value of h by two. Right? So, so, so in this example, you only consider functions h that have the property that if you look at h of x plus one minus h of x, an absolute value is equal to one. Right? So you only look at configurations h uh, that always sort of change by either plus one or minus one. And then if you have a local maximum, you can turn it into a local minimum and it keeps that property and the same for turning local minima into local maxima. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? So Jakob, you had a question well, uh, in the chat. You, you wrote, do you have a simulation of a BC? So boundary conditions? Or? The Brownian castle? No, well, ah, that, was the, so that was the simulation. This is the simulation. Well, I mean, this is the simulation of somehow this infinite temperature version of uh, ballistic deposition, which converges uh, to this Brownian castle as you rescale. Right? So this here is the simulation. So if you want the, as a H here would be the, uh, again, sort of a, at every point you look at essentially the largest brick above that point, that's your H. No, it's not exactly that because you can have ha overhangs here, but it's essentially that. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you associate an equation to the Brownian castle? No, so, okay, so that's a good question. So the equation that you would somehow like to associate, uh, so let me see if I, okay, so I can go back to, uh, it takes a while to go through the whole, um, you would want to write down this equation here um, is equal to dxh times psi plus theta. Right, so, so if you want, it's like a you have some sort of a transport equation where your transport vector field is itself something like a white noise but then you have an additional source term, which is an independent white noise. Right? So in, in some kind of formal sense, uh, it should satisfy this equation in the sense that if you, if you replace these guys by just some smooth random fields with, you know, which are sufficiently mixing and you rescale that, then you would expect that to converge to this final castle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further questions? There is one in the chat. Uh, okay. So this, uh, the argument, okay, there, there's no extremely good argument of why you would expect the trajectory from Browning Castle to KPZ to be unique. Um, in some, the argument is that you, you can somehow, you, you can try to think of, so what would the process look like? Essentially what it would do is that in the simulation, so what happens here in the simulation is that these discontinuities essentially just perform uh, themselves coalescing running motions, right? So the discontinuities themselves simply move around diffusively 
um, the process that is supposed to interpolate between this and KPZ, if you sort of think about it formally, what it should do is it should essentially just be exactly the same process, but now the motion of the discontinuity is not a brown motion, but it's a brown motion with drift. And the drift is given by the height of the discontinuity. Okay. Um, and then you would expect this, well, to be that process. So that should be some kind of characterization uh, of that process. Um, whereas for the, uh, the crossover from the Brownian castle to Edwards Wilkinson, you can, uh, you can describe that somehow in terms of some construction, which is called the, uh, the Brownian net. So it's essentially, it's a little bit like the Brownian web, but I, then again, uh, where at every point, in some sense, it's like a, okay, uh, a discrete version, a standard discrete construction of the Brownian web is the following, right? Where you, you take a grid, so you take a copy of Z2, but turned by 45 degree, and then at every point, uh, you, you choose an arrow sort of that goes either to the left or to the right randomly, right? And, and then uh, what you do is, well, so here I've chosen the arrow, here I've chosen it, here I haven't, right? So something like this, for example. Uh, so at every point you choose that arrow randomly and then, well, you see that you can kind of imagine how the scaling limit of this picture uh, converges to the Brownian web and the dual one is essentially the one where you add in the dual uh, the dual lattice and you sort of follow the only way that you can follow without crossing these arrows, right? So that's the standard construction of the Brownian web, uh, standard discrete version of it. And now, now you can imagine some situations where at each lattice point here, instead of choosing your direction once and for all and then freezing it, you actually attach to it the law of a random variable, right? Uh, and now in order to uh, pick the realization of your Brownian web, what you do is you actually, you somehow draw a realization from that random variable. Uh, but if I choose, you know, in my, uh, in my construction where I somehow take different space time points and then I look at my backwards characteristics, if I take two different characteristics, I choose two independent realizations. So in this way, I can kind of interpolate between the Brownian web in which I would in some sense, just choose at every point a deterministic random variable, which either deterministically tells me to go left or deterministically tells me to go right. Or I could, the complete opposite would be to assign to every point a random variable, which simply tells me go left with probability a half, go right with probability a half. And then my backwards characteristic would simply be allowed to cross. They would just be independent brand new motions and I just see the heat equation, the stochastic heat equation. And now I can sort of interpolate between these two by taking, by assigning random variables that are almost deterministic. Um, and if you do that, you can kind of, you can build the scaling limit uh, of that. Uh, but you see that there's much more freedom. So in the sense that there's, well, there's the law of that random variable that becomes somehow a degree of freedom. Uh, so there's a degree of freedom is essentially one measure. Um, and you can actually construct observables that distinguish between them. So it seems that you really get different processes for different choices. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions. So many thanks, Martin, for giving the first talk, uh, the IMP seminars. <laughs> it was a pleasure. <laughs>